Good afternoon, everyone. I am Danielle Linder, and I am the External Relations Coordinator here at Mary Greeley. Vicki had a meeting added to her calendar today and asked if I could step in for her. So thank you for joining us. Welcome to our Mary Greeley Prime Time Alive presentation, Diabetic Education, What's New and Exciting? I am Danielle Linder, and I am filling in for Vicki today. As a reminder, if you would like more information about Primetime Alive, please visit our website at www.mgmc.org backslash PTA. Our presenter today is Lynn Maves. Lynn received her bachelor's degree from Iowa State University in dietetics and food and nutrition. She received her master of public health from the University of Minnesota. She worked at a variety of different jobs in Iowa, Minnesota, and North Dakota before starting at Mary Greeley. She has been at Mary Greeley for almost 19 years as a certified diabetes care and education specialist in, in Diabetes and Nutrition Education Center. Please welcome Lynn. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm not quite as tall as Danielle, so I'll try and stay over here so those of you in here, because I, I can hide behind the screen really well. Um, okay, like she said, my name is Lynn, and I've been here for quite a while. Some of you maybe have seen me before. I've done a few other talks, um, but it's been a few years since I've done it, done something. And actually, I did one similar to this several years back. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation. Okay, first of all, I always like to, whenever we talk about diabetes, we want to talk a little bit about what it is. Diabetes is a chronic, which means it's, a, means it's lifelong disease characterized by high blood sugar from either insufficient insulin production or the inability to use insulin that's produced, which we call insulin resistance, or both. So basically, your pancreas isn't either isn't making insulin, isn't making enough insulin, or your cells are resistant to the insulin. Um, so types of diabetes. Um, these are kind of the recognized types right now. Type 1 is the kind where the pancreas stops making insulin. This used to be called um, juvenile onset, but now it's called type 1 because we actually have people, because they used to think that it was people who were younger that got it. But um, now we've known for quite some time that even people who are older in their 40s and 50s can get type 1 diabetes. Okay. Um, <laughs> And it's called an autoimmune disorder um, is, is what type 1 is. Type 2 um, a lot of times starts out with insulin resistance and is kind of a little bit more pro progressive. And this one used to be called adult onset. But again, we're seeing kids with it now too. Um, the body doesn't use the insulin as well as it should, and that's what insulin resistance means. And or there's a decrease in the, in the amount of insulin that's made. So sometimes it's a combination of the two. And sometimes it progresses to where the body isn't making as much insulin, and then those people do have to go on insulin as well. Gestational diabetes is a type of diabetes that occurs during pregnancy. Um, it's a very similar in some ways to type 2 diabetes, but it's triggered kind of by the, the hormones of pregnancy or trigger, is triggered by the hormones of pregnancy. Um, typically with traditional gestational diabetes, it will go away after the baby is born. We do have some people who then um, progress and do end up with type 2, and occasionally someone ends up with type 1. Um, and then we have prediabetes, and we'll talk about what the diagnosis criteria is for all of these. And that's where they've got elevated blood glucose levels, um, but they're not quite to the level where it would be considered diabetes yet. So it does, they don't, you don't quite meet the diag diagnostic criteria, but you're just slightly above what is considered that normal lab, right? And then we have diabetes due to other causes. Um, and so sometimes people might get diabetes, um, if you've known anyone who's had to go on steroids for any period of time, they might have steroid-induced diabetes. And there are a variety of other ones that um, you can think about that, would, that might come up that would fall under that category. But these top ones up here are the ones that we would primarily talk about. All right, so this is how we diagnose diabetes. Tim, how do I get rid of this box? Just click on that. Ah, there we go, got it. Okay, so here's our diagnostic criteria. 
Okay, so down here, this is our A1C. Um, and an A1C gives us an idea of what those blood sugars have been for the last three months. And so it, for a number of years, has been able to be used for uh, diabetes. Um, normal would be considered below 5.7%. If it's between 5.7 and 6.4, that would be considered pre-diabetes. Uh, if it's 6.5 or greater, mouse, 6.5 or greater, that would be um, diagnostic of diabetes. We can also use um, fasting, FPG, just stands for fasting glucose levels. So that would be in the morning before you've eaten anything, right? So normal, without diabetes or prediabetes, we would expect to see that number below 100, okay? If that number is between 100 and 126, um, that would be considered, um, or 100 and less than 126, that would be considered prediabetes. And 126 or greater could be diabetes. Typically, they're not going to diagnose you just with one number. They would repeat that before they would say, oh, you, you know, before they would make that diagnosis and, maybe, and also probably do an A1C along with it. The other thing that could happen is what's called an oral glucose tolerance test. Um, and the oral glucose tolerance test, uh, you drink a liquid, um, it's 75 grams, and then they check your blood sugar afterwards. And um, if it is, it should be less than 140. If you know you don't have diabetes, pre-diabetes, 140 to 200, above 200 would be diabetes. Another way that they might say this is if you check your blood sugar at any time during the day, after a meal or at any time, and you've got symptoms of diabetes and it's above 200, that would also be diagnostic. So if they check it at any time during the day and it's above 200. So that's just called a random glucose test. And those um, diagnoses are, don't talk about gestational. I'm not talking about gestational today um, because I don't think we probably have a lot of pregnant or looking to be pregnant people in the audience. <laughs> so I didn't talk about those, uh, those, those diagnosis, diagnostic criteria for you today. Okay. I always like to, when I do this, think about where we've come from. So we want to think about where we've been with this and where uh, diabetes has come from. We've made just a lot of progress over the years. It's quite impressive, actually. Okay, so here's a little timeline. So 1910 was when insulin was discovered. 1916, Elliot Jocelyn published The Treatment of Diabetes Mellitus. Um, and, you know, the first treatments were basically, you know, starving people pretty much and not allowing them to eat any carbohydrates. So it was a little bit scary. Um, 1923, the first production of insulin by Eli Lilly, which is still a company that makes, our, our, makes insulin for us now. Um, 1940, the American Diabetes Association is founded. So that's our ADA, American Di Diabetes Association, where we get a lot of our standards from. And that's where I use information. I used a lot of their information to update this talk. And then Becton Dixon produces the first insulin syringe. Okay. So then in 1950, the diabetes exchanges, we call them exchanges. We don't really use those as much anymore, but those were born in 1950. And in 1953, the first tablets for testing urine glucose became available. So we really didn't have a lot of options for testing glucose before then. 1953 was when that started. Um, and in 1955, we had the first oral medications for type 2 diabetes. Um, insulin can't be, isn't taken oral, oral, orally. So for people with type 1, they have to go on insulin. But people with type 2, they can take the oral medications. And the first one were called sulfonylureas. We still have some sulfonylureas that are used today. They aren't quite the same as the ones that were, um, were found way back then. They've had second generation of them. Okay. And in 1959, here's where we get that differentiation between type 1 and type 2. Individuals who don't produce insulin um, are called type 1. And then those who do produce insulin but still are having these same elevated blood sugars are considered type 2. So we went from 1910 to 1959 before we saw that differentiation, right? Okay. So, and here we've got Ames in here a couple of times. The Ames company, 
I'm, I'm guessing they were here names. I don't know for sure. The Ames company introduced the first strips for testing blood glucose by color code. Okay, so here is our first meter. We've got samples of these up in our, some of our archived stuff upstairs. It's kind of funny how big they are compared to what we've got now. Um, and that was in 1964. So again, we found out about this disease way back 1910, 1923, you know, and we don't really have anything to really good for testing until 1964. So that's a long time um, for testing at home. 1970, the Ames Company introduced the first glucose meter. And then in 1976, the first insulin pump was used. And when we get to insulin pumps, I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. Um, but the, the, this was the first insulin pump. And I think he actually, actually had to be attached, plugged into the wall. So he couldn't go very far with that. Um, 1977, they developed the test called glycosylated hemoglobin, or our A1C, that we use today. Um, so, and then in 79, we got the classification of insulin dependent or type one, non-insulin dependent or type two, and then gestational diabetes and diabetes associated with other syndromes. 1995, metformin, which if any of you have diabetes and have type two diabetes or know someone who has type two diabetes, this is probably the first medication that just about everybody goes on for type two diabetes. That was, wasn't developed until 1995. It seems like it should have been around longer than that, right? Because it seems like everybody's on it, right? Um, and then our first rapid-acting insulin, which people use at mealtime, called Humalog, was developed, wasn't developed till 1996. So before that, we had other kinds of insulins um, that, that could be used, um, but it was just a little harder to pinpoint and get prevent lows and control those blood sugars like we can now. In 2006, the first continuous glucose monitoring system was released. So, and I stopped our timeline there because I felt like if we go on from there, it kind of ruins the punchline for me. So we're just going to keep going from here after that, okay? All right, where we are now. Okay, prevalence of diabetes. Um, these are the most recent statistics that I could find in 2021, 37.3 million children and adults in the United States with diabetes. Undiagnosed are 8 million people, 28.7 million are diagnosed, and pre-diabetes they figure is about 96 million people. And this is in the U.S. Um, $237 billion is the total cost of diagnosed diabetes in the United States. That's from March 2017. Um, and that's the actual dollar cost. So we're not talking about, you know, how people's lives change and things like that that happen. Medical expenses for people with diabetes are um, 2.3 times higher than for people without diabetes. And that might actually be even higher than that now. All right, how do we manage it? Um, so for a long time, it was the lifestyle and medications, whether it be oral medications or insulin. But in the last how many years, we've got some pretty pretty interesting technological advances that have really helped people with diabetes to manage their chronic diseases. Okay, so we're going to start with lifestyle management because when somebody is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, if um, their blood sugars aren't too high, that's a lot of times where we start. That's our starting point is we're going to start with, with lifestyle management. So lifestyle management means diet, and that doesn't mean that we're telling you to starve yourself or count your calories or anything like that. It, diet just means your meal plan. That's all that we mean by diet, okay? Exercise, which actually there's a lot of discussion now about really that should be termed physical activity rather than exercise because anything can work. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. And then this one, stress management self-care has really been um, emphasized a lot in recent years. And again, a lot has been found, just like with everything else, that mind-body connection that we got. Okay? So we're going to start with diet. And like I said, this is really just basically meal plan. Okay? Um, think about it as lifestyle meal plan. It's not something that you're just going to stay on for a short period of time. This is something that you want to stay on, that you feel like you can stay on for the rest of your life. All right? So I've got a few different options here. The plate method is a lot of times where we start for people. Um, 
Mediterranean diet uh, is another really good option. And then I've got a couple of other ones that you may or may not have heard of that I threw in there too, just for, for the fun of it, because we're having fun today, right? And one of my colleagues was like, Lynn, that's such a pretty picture. And I said, yeah, I know that's why I put it on there. And look at just, that's how your plate should look, just beautiful like that. So think, remember that when you do your plate, okay? All right, so the first one is the plate method of meal planning. And we really like to use this one. And there are a couple different versions of plate method of meal planning. And this is what we call the diabetes version of the plate method of meal planning. Um, because we have half your plate would be these non-starchy vegetables. And that's usually kind of where we start with the emphasis. So twice a day, a couple of your meals a day should be half the plate should be those non-starchy vegetables. Now, you know, that's not always the way everybody eats, right? And non-starchy vegetables aren't corn and peas. Those are starchy vegetables. So, you know, here in Iowa, corn and peas are eaten a lot, right? So um, sometimes it's a little different fit thought process, but we luckily now we've got a lot of things available in the grocery stores. We've got a lot of farmer's markets in the summer. So we have a lot of those vegetables. And right now we're still getting, you know, the harvest stuff from those. So it's really nice to get those. And then a quarter of your plate should be starches or starchy vegetables. A quarter of your plate should be protein. Okay, and this is a nine-inch plate. And then a, a side of fruit and a side of milk. Okay. So notice we don't really call it dairy. We call it milk. So milk, yogurt would go in that category. Cheese, we actually consider a protein in this meal plan. Okay. So this meal plan is a really good one for help, not only helping you select what foods, but also the portion of your foods. And it's a great one for when you eat out. Um, it's really helpful with that. All right. Mediterranean meal plan um, is another great one that's gained a lot of popularity. Um, basically, almost any chronic condition that you have, they'll say, what's a good diet for that? We say Mediterranean diet, <laughs> because it really is. Um, it, again, emphasizes a lot of those fruits and vegetables and whole grains that we've talked about before. There's also an emphasis on um, our fish, and particularly the fatty fish. And then in, in a lesser amount, we've got the poultry, eggs, cheese, and yogurt. And then up here at the top, so not nearly as much or minimal amount, we've got higher fat meats and sweets. And it does say it's okay to have wine and stuff on the side and drinking water. But also at the base of that pyramid, which is good to know and good to think about, is activity, um, socializing. So having that social aspect of your meal, being active in your lifestyle, and doing all of that along with the diet. So it's not really just a meal plan and a diet. It's really kind of a lifestyle plan. So we want to think of it that way. But the Mediterranean diet, I tell people the Mediterranean diet is a good way to think about what foods to choose. And the plate method of meal planning is a good way to put those foods on your plate and determine about how much you want to eat during the day at that meal. Okay. So that's kind of how I start people off with it. And again, this is just a starting point. Okay. And then other meal plans to consider um, we've got the Nordic diet, and I don't have a lot of information listed on here. The Nordic diet is kind of just a, one that is out there. It's a little bit newer and gaining some popularity. It's almost exactly the same as the Mediterranean diet. It has the lifestyle component. It emphasizes um, lots of fruits and vegetables and whole grains. It um, encourages you to eat plenty of fatty fish. Um, it also tells you to watch how much of those red meats and sweets and added sugars. The difference with this one is it really puts a lot of emphasis on berries and a lot of your dark, um, like those red and purple colored fruits and vegetables and stuff. And it also, rather than using olive oil, it emphasizes using canola oil instead. And then the mind diet is, and I have to read what it stands for. I'll read it for you in this book. Okay. The MIND diet stands for Mediterranean-Intervention for, for Neurodegenerative Delay. So it is used for people with um, Alzheimer's and um, 
cognitive decline and things like that. There is a lot of research on it, a lot of science behind it. Um, so it is very similar. It combines the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, which the DASH diet is quite frequently used um, for people with, with heart disease. Um, and it can be used for people with diabetes too. Uh, but a lot of times we kind of lean more towards the Mediterranean diet. Um, so it combines those two. But again, it puts a lot more emphasis on berries again and those um, purple and red colored things uh, because of the antioxidant benefits to those. So it does put a little bit more attention on that as well. But all of these would be like anti-inflammatory too, which they're finding, you know, the negative side effects of inflammation. And so all of them would be considered anti-inflammatory. All right. Now we're going to get into exercise. And remember I said exercise, really, we kind of maybe want to think about that as more physical activity rather than exercise. Um, just because any kind of movement is going to be good. So this is from, oh, did we go? Did I miss one? I think I'm missing a slide. Okay, that's all right. This one is almost the same as the other one. Um, these are the exercise recommendations from the American College of Sports Medicine. And the American Diabetes Association ones are just about the same. So um, we're looking at having aerobic activity. So walking, biking, jogging, swimming, things like that, 150 to 300 minutes per week. So if you want to think about it in an easier way, it's about 30 minutes per day, five days per week. Okay. And it doesn't have to be all at one time. And that's kind of what the uh, American Diabetes Association says is you don't have to do it all at one time. It can be um, 10 minutes here and 10 minutes there. So you can do 10 minutes, do that three times a day. And that's your 30 minutes, right? But they also are emphasizing now resistance training, which is weights, elastic bands, two to three days a week. And they do recommend not to do that on consecutive days. But it can be anything simple as using soup cans at home. It can use, be using your own body weight. It can be resistance bands, whatever you want to do, okay? Flexibility. So flexibility could be stretching. It could be things like yoga, tai chi, anything like that. And then balance exercises, which are core and lower body work. And those should be two to three days a week. Okay. So um, putting the fun in fitness. So redefine exercise. Find pleasure in the activities you do. Do things like gardening, dancing, et cetera. All of those things are, are activities. And that's why I said we kind of emphasize it more as activity rather than um, as exercise because anything like that can fit. Get social. Find a fitness buddy. Find somebody who will walk with you or go to the gym with you. Take an exercise class. And um, a lot of times you, when you take an exercise class, those people get to be your friends and you can do other things with them too. Um, vacations and travel can be a great way to incorporate more activity. Uh, I was at a wedding um, over the weekend and they had some sli a slideshow of the bride and groom just of all of the different things that they were doing as far as hiking and going on these different things. And something that we like to do when we go on vacation is, you know, where can we go to see different things? And you can see a lot of things when you're out moving around, either riding a bike or walking, or um, maybe you're out uh, rowing in um, either a kayak or a canoe or something like that. So a lot of different ways to get activity when you're out on vacation. So think about that too. Add the fun factor. Don't like to work out? Try adding light activity to things that you do enjoy. Do a light workout. <clears throat> Excuse me. Need a little drink of water here. All right. <clears throat> Try adding light activity to things that you do enjoy. Um, maybe while watching your favorite TV show <clears throat> or doing activities with family and friends. All of a sudden, apparently, I'm losing my voice. Don't know why, but there we go. Um, turn up the tunes. So turn on the radio, find some fun favorite tunes, and get up and get moving. You know, If your grandkids or great-grandkids are over, 
turn on those fun songs that they like to listen to and dance with them. They will think it's a hoot and a half and you'll be getting activity. So do some thing, fun things like that. And then you're getting involved with your family or, you know, go out and do, you know, instead of at Thanksgiving, just, you know, eating the turkey or whatever, get up and go play football or go for a walk or, um, you know, go bowling or something like that. You know, something to get up and get moving together at all together. Okay. Fun and exciting facts about exercise. Activity. We're going to call it activity instead. Reduces the incidence of heart disease and high blood pressure by approximately 40%. Um, lower the risk of stroke by 27%. Lower the risk of developing type 2 diabetes by, 40, by 58%. Um, a low level of fitness is a bigger risk factor for mortality, so death, than mild or moderate obesity. It's better to be fit and overweight than unfit with a lower percentage of body fat. It can decrease depression as effectively as Prozac or behavioral therapy. So again, you know, we, we talk about all these medications and a lot of times we do need to have people on medications, but then that's why we just start with lifestyle. But just think of all of these benefits that exercise does. Um, and it's, it's kind of like they say, they're saying now exercise is medicine, which it really is. You know, activity is medicine because it does all of these things for your body. Our bodies were meant to be moving. Okay. Stress management and self-care. So um, this is something that can be just anything that gives you better quality of life. Maybe it helps to relax you and get rid of some of that stress. Because let's face it, when you're diagnosed with a chronic condition, that's stressful. It's stressful for you. It's stressful for your loved ones and all of the people around you. So doing something like this um, can tend to help. So yoga and tai chi um, are just some movements with breath that will a lot of times help to relieve stress for people. Um, and then obviously relieving stress helps to benefit your health all the way around. Meditation can be um, just some breathing. It can be prayer, can be anything like that. Mindfulness is just thinking about being mindful of the moment, being mindful of what you're eating, being mindful of what's around you. Maybe even just looking around and seeing if you can see all the different colors of a rainbow in the room that you're in, or what different sounds can you hear when you're outside. So just being mindful of your surroundings and being mindful of your presence. Hobbies. Hobbies are just a way to kind of keep our bodies and our minds busy and doing other things. And then again, the spiritual aspect, whatever that might be, um, that can kind of go along again, like, with, like I said, with meditation. Okay, now we're going to go on to medications, all right, and, um, and then we'll talk about technology. And I think I'm going to have to go through it a little bit faster so we don't run out. Okay, first I've got our type 2 medications, um, and these, these are the oral ones, or some of the oral ones. So we're starting with, um, these are the ones that kind of are the preferred medications right now, specifically these top three right here are the preferred ones. We already mentioned metformin. And then this next class is called the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, and that is Invokana, Farsiga, Jardians. Um, and they've been around for a little while. Invokana was the first one to come out. And those help your body to excrete the um, glucose through the urine. They really have some other benefits that I'm going to talk about in, after, when we talk about um, some of the injectable insulin injectable medications for diabetes as well, for type 2 diabetes. And then we've got a GLP-1, which I had to write down what this is because it's a mouthful. We always just call them a GLP-1. So um, they're called a gluca glucagon-like peptide is what those are, okay? And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a follow-up slide here. And then we've got our um, DPP-4s, and those are Genuvia, Ungliza, and Trojenta. And then we, I mentioned earlier the sulfonylureas, and these are the ones that are on the market right now, glyburide, glipizide, and glimepiride. And the TZDs, um, there was Avandia and Actos. Avandia isn't really used much anymore, but we do see Actos once in a while. These aren't used quite as much because of some of the potential negative side effects. Um, they are um, inexpensive, so sometimes they're prescribed for that reason. But um, the slide before are usually the ones that are preferred if 
if they're affordable for the patient. Okay, and then these are our injectable non-insulin medications. And remember I talked about those glu glucagon-like peptides. So we've got several different ones here. Actually, our first um, GLP-1 was um, by Bayetta, and that was, I believe, 2008. It's the, no the year that I remembered. Um, and that one you had to take, um, I think it was twice a day, <laughs> And then all of these that are listed on here, it's made by the same company that makes by Duran. All of these that are on here, except for true, uh, except for Victoza, you take once weekly. So you take this injection once weekly. There are a lot of so how these act is they um, got a couple of different actions to them. They they stimulate um, glucose dependent insulin release. They slow gastric emptying. Um, they promote satiety, and they suppress glucagon being um, released from the liver. So health benefits of these, and then this one is like brand new, like October 15th, I think, Manjaro. So it's brand new. It's a combination of a GLP-1 and a GIP, a glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. That's a mouthful. Okay. So and it acts much the same as the GLP-1, um, but it gives a little bit more of a boost, more oomph to um, the health benefits. So not only are these medications great for um, lowering your blood sugar, just like I talked about the SGLT2 inhibitors, the ones that help to secrete it through the urine, um, those are both really good at help lowering your, your blood sugars, but also both of those types will help with weight loss. And as a matter of fact, the number one drug for weight loss in Hollywood right now, Ozempic. The number one drug for weight loss in Hollywood. So um, if you're having a shortage, if you're trying to get it and there's a shortage, we're going to blame those people in Hollywood or who are taking it, right? Okay. No, just kidding. Um, but it is right now the number one use. It is used as a weight loss drug as well. So uh, it is prescribed just as a weight loss drug, um, and there is uh, a different there's a higher dosage of it for one that is strictly a weight loss drug, but we've got several different levels of Ozempic, um, and we do have people who are on it just for weight loss, um, as well as Trulicity. We see some people who are on that one for weight loss as well, um, but usually Ozempic. And then Manjaro is, again, we get just even a little bit more of that benefit of weight loss um, with it, so uh, we'll probably be seeing more of that one too uh, so that one's a good one to see. But along with the weight loss, these GLP-1s also have um, cardiovascular risk reduction benefits. So decrease the risk of heart disease and, and uh, death from heart disease and stroke for both of those, um, heart attack and stroke. And then the SGLT2 inhibitors, those they're also finding have renal protective benefits. So for kidney disease, they can be beneficial. They're just finding out new things all the time with those. So um, it's kind of interesting. We're seeing uh, kidney doctors actually prescribe the SGLT2 inhibitors because it's helping with kidney function. And it also, like I said, is used for people with diabetes. And then um, people who have diabetes who are seeing a, a, a heart doctor, those doctors are a lot of times encouraging these GLP-1s or the SGLT2 inhibitors um, because they see the benefits for their practice as well for that side of it because that's how linked these things are together. They work very synergistically. Okay, and here we've got our insulins. Insulins can be used for people with type 1, type 2, or gestational diabetes, okay? We've got the rapid-acting insulins. Those are the ones that we use at mealtime, um, and they're also the ones that are put in pumps. We have ultra-rapid-acting. These, these are fairly new. Um, these weren't here the last time when I did this talk, but we have these ultra rapid acting ones. Then we have our long acting ones. We have Lantus, Basaglar, Simgly is the newest one, and Traceba are long acting. And we could also put um, this 2JO up there in that long acting, but I've got it down here. And then intermediate acting is NPH. Um, that one we use a lot of times with our patients who have gestational diabetes because it helps with covering that fasting blood sugar when they take it at night. Or it's one that's pretty inexpensive to buy over the, the counter if you don't have insurance when you go to like Walmart or someplace like that. 
um, you can buy a vial of it pretty in- inexpensively. So for people who don't have insurance or don't have good insurance, it's a good option. It doesn't cover quite as well. It's a little it makes it a little bit more challenging to get those normalized blood sugars, but it, it is uh, effective. We also have for people who are really insulin resistant, remember I talked about those type 2 patients or people who get insulin resistant, we have the U500, which is five times the strength of regular insulin, and other long-acting options. We've got Traceba and Tujeo, which are both long-acting. And remember, Traceba is up here as a long-acting, but it also has a version that's um, stronger. So Traceba is two times the strength of Lantus when you get the the um, more intensive option. And then to JO, those are both long acting. And then U200 is a rapid acting. So I meant this should actually say they aren't longer acting. They're ones that have more oomph to them. So they're twi- they're more strength to them is what they are. So sorry about that. That was an error on my part. And then one thing that I didn't put on here as I was going through this I forgot to put, there's an inhaled insulin too that's been out for a while. We just don't have a lot of people use it. It's called a Frezza and they just have these little cartridges and they inhale it. It, it works. I've had a few people on it, um, but we don't have very many people that use it around here. So, but it does work. Okay. Now, along with these medications, sometimes when somebody's taking a medication that lowers their blood sugar, it can lower it too far, right? Especially with these insulins. So we call that hypoglycemia. And these are kind of long-standing recommendations for treating hypoglycemia. If your blood sugar is less than 70, you want to treat with 15 milligrams or 15 grams. That says milligrams. Should be grams. That's switched around. <laughs> so switch that around to it so it says grams. Another typo in there. I went through this about three or four times, and you would think I would find these things, right? (laughs) That should be 15 grams of a rapid-acting carbohydrate. Wait 15 minutes and recheck and repeat as needed. Even had somebody else look at it, and she didn't notice it either. So, Um, Okay, and then for severe hypoglycemia, which is uh, blood sugar of less than 55 and or loss of function with that, we uh, have these glucagon kits. And the glucagon kits um, are a syringe that has a liquid in them, plus then it's this vial that has a powder in it. And you would have to inject the the liquid into the solid and shake it up and then draw that up and inject it into the person. So somebody else would have to do that for you. So quite a process. So a little bit intimidating. All right, now we've got these new treatments for severe hypoglycemia. Um, this one's called Baxemi, and it's a nasal spray. So instead of having to mix that whole thing, if you've got someone who, anyone who knows someone who's had a low blood sugar that they've gotten so low that, you know, they can't treat themselves, you know what it's like. And so instead of trying to mix that injection, you can use this. It's a nasal one. And then this one is a pre-mixed injection. So you don't have to do the mixing like you did before. And it's got a two-year expiration. Both of these have two-year expiration, while, whereas the other one had a one-year expiration. Okay. Devices and technology. We've got meters, continuous glucose meters, smart pens, insulin pumps, and then automated insulin delivery systems. Okay. Blood glucose meter is where we've come from. Remember, I showed you this old one right here, and then we had some newer versions of some things here, and some of these look pretty new, but we've gotten a lot more advanced since then. So this is what our meters are looking like now. A lot of our meters now are Bluetooth capable, and so uh, they can be sent to a phone, and then actually that can be shared with us here, either by uh, sending it through an email or a fax and faxing it to us, or doing a, a, a screenshot of it and sending a, it through the medical record. So we're uh, getting some more of the access to those kind of things as well. All right, continuous glucose monitors. A continuous glucose monitor is an FDA-approved device that provides real-time or intermittent glucose readings throughout the day and night, allowing people with diabetes to see their glucose levels and track how quickly they're increasing or decreasing. 
So these devices are put on every 14 days or 10 days or um, seven days, depending on the device. And they don't have to, most of them, these two, the top two, they don't have to check their blood sugar at all because this is doing it for them. So there's no calibration anymore. So this is the Medtronic one. And we don't see quite as many of that one. People have to calibrate with that one. This is a Dexcom. Um, and so you've got, you can use the phone. There's a reader that goes along with it. Um, you put it on. It's, it's FDA approved for the abdomen, but we have people who wear it on the arm. And again, they see it real time. So they can see that information real time and just look down at their phone and they can see what their blood sugar is without poking their finger, right? All right. And then CGM continued. Here we've got the Libre 2. This one, um, it has a, either a little reader or your phone, and you just take that device and scan the little button that's on your arm right here, and it shows you what your readings are. The Libre 3 is the size of, size of two pennies stacked up, so it's very small, and it goes on the arm. And this one you don't have to scan. It gives real time. So uh, that is our latest one that's come out. And then this is kind of some of the stuff that we can see. It Instead of, not always are we just looking at what your blood sugars are. We're looking at what your time in range is. So really a goal would be at least 70%. So this person here is only 63% in range. So we'd like to see that a little bit better, right? But we can see this data just like they can see it on the phone at home. So they can share it with us and give us a call and say, hey, could you look at my readings? And we can see it remotely without them even having to come in, which is kind of nice when you do like telehealth and things like that, right? All right. And then as far as insulin delivery systems, we've got these smart insulin pen devices. Um, the one that's on the market right now is called the InPen. It actually works uh, kind of with the Dexcom. You can see the Dexcom data along with it. It will record stuff and it remembers stuff if you sync it in with the phone. It will record stuff on there so we can see when somebody's given their insulin and things like that when they come back in to see us. And there is an app that goes along with it. And there are a couple of other apps that coordinate with it that can be shared with us so we can see it that way as well. Okay, now we're at insulin pumps. So this is where we've come from. Remember I showed you this one where you had to be plugged into the wall. And then we've got some of these older versions. And this one still is used. A version of this one is still used. And then this one, a version of it is still used. Okay, this is how an insulin pump works. You've got an infusion set that's attached to your body. And there's a little plastic tube or a metal tube that goes into the body that's called a cannula. And here's your insulin pump. And in the insulin pump, there's a reservoir in there that holds the insulin. And then it holds either 200 or 300 units, depending on the pump. And then there's tubing for two of the pumps. And one of the pumps doesn't have tubing. It's a pod. But um, so the insulin goes from this pump or from this reservoir through the tubing and then into that little cannula that's in the body. Okay. So instead of injecting themselves how many times a day, four, six times a day, they can just program in and hit some buttons now and um, it will deliver it. And these infusion sites need to be changed every two to three days. All right. Um, where we are now. So now not only do we just have those basic insulin pumps, we also have these automated insulin delivery systems. So what that means is they work with that Dexcom. Remember I said we've got the Dexcom or those continuous glucose monitors and they're giving us the information real time. Well, the pumps are working with these continuous glucose monitors, and they actually are increasing and decreasing the amount of insulin somebody gets based on what that CGM reading is. So with these pumps, the thought process behind it is that for a lot of people, if, we've, if their settings are right, if everything's working the right way, all they would have to do is give their insulin for that meal time and deliver the bolus at that time, and then... Um, the pump would kind of handle everything else. Now, the patient still has to put some effort in. It's not like we put it on and it just takes care of everything. It's a learning process and there's a lot to it, uh, but it is really nice. And um, a lot of, both of these two now have, well, all three of them 
have a phone app where we can see it remotely. But these two, both the Omnipod and the Tandem ones, they both have an option where people can actually deliver their bolus from their phone now. So we've really come a long ways, right? Okay, and this is kind of some of the readings and stuff that we can see remotely. So again, somebody calls up and we can see what's going on with their blood sugars. We can see what the pump is doing. We can see where their blood sugars are at. We can see what they're doing with their insulin. So um, it's really a very helpful tool um, and it's really helped a lot of people to manage their diabetes a lot better. Okay, so and then we get to social media and use of technology. Um, you know, there's always things, of course, you can't always believe everything on the internet, right? Well, maybe you can. No, not really. We've got Facebook, Twitter, but a lot of these groups have a Facebook page, like American Diabetes Association, um, a, a lot of American Heart Association, a lot of these, you can follow them on Twitter, you can follow them on Facebook, and they can share a lot of information with you that way. Um, blogs where people are talking about different things. YouTube, uh, we use YouTube a lot for people to uh, watch some of the videos on how to use some of these devices, um, what they, they can watch them at home, or for doing activities at home. We uh, have certain ones that we encourage people to look at. Pinterest is a great one for recipes. If you like to find new recipes, that's a good place to find it. Other apps and websites. So we've got some websites here that you can look things up. And it tells about what they are. Um, and so these are all some reliable ones. And this was just updated just recently. And here are some phone apps. So we've got everything from tracking food. Um, there is one that even takes a picture here, the barcode scanner for nutrition information. Um, and then we've got the blood glucose meters. They've got apps for theirs so we can see that. And then, of course, we've got all these things. I don't know if you can see it, but I've got my fitness watch on, right? My Apple watch. So they all have their apps too. So you can watch all kinds of stuff on there, right? All right. Whenever we are talking about web health literacy, we want to think about a few things. Um, does the content come from a credible source? Is the content kept up to date? Is the content easy to understand? Is the content easily access accessible? And so here these guys are, you know, don't worry, we're from the internet. We can't always trust everything from the internet, right? So make sure you're looking at a credible source. And if you have questions, you know, feel free to give us a call. We'll help you out. But if you look at some of those ones that I suggested on the previous slides, um, those are a credible source. All right. I can't wait to see what the future brings. It's been changing quickly. And this is from Back to the Future. If you don't know that. <laughs> that movie. I love that movie. It cracks me up. And I thought it fits perfect with this presentation. So now we've got 13 minutes left. So I kind of rushed through that last part. So if you have any questions, I need to repeat the questions um, so that we get it recorded for people. Sure. And Danielle has a microphone too. So does anybody have questions? There's one right there. Testing. Great. Okay. I have a type 2 and have had for probably 25 years. It was diagnosed. Okay. And I've been on metformin all this time, various amounts. Right. And I've got my sugar is quite under control. I was wondering if, number one, if metformin is some kind of insulin. No. I never met, thought, yeah. No, metformin okay. is not. Metformin is a, a medication that helps your body to um, be more sensitive to the insulin that it's making. So it helps okay. your cells to be more sensitive. Okay. And it also blocks the liver's production of glucose. So like Sometimes in the morning, especially if you've got some insulin resistance, your blood sugars might be higher, yeah. right, yeah. without eating. That's the liver saying, hey, wake up. I'm, you haven't fed me in a long time. I'm giving you a little oh. bit more glucose. Mm. And so metformin helps to block that. So that's why it's, one, it's a really good one for people with type 2. Okay. 
and that and that it helps the cells to be more sensitive to sensitive to insulin. Okay, so it then, really works well with the other medications as well. Can you be on a drug metformin f- forever if it's well, working? We have people who are on it for a long time. Most doctors are are checking labs and things yeah. to make sure that it's okay. So as as long as they're keeping up with those standards of care, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay, thank you. Because they're finding benefits to metformin too, other than just the blood sugar stuff. So yeah. Good. Anybody else? Check with Tim and see if he has any questions online. There are no online questions. There are no online questions. There we go. Sorry, I didn't see your hand up. There you go. Okay, I know you didn't really talk that much about gestational, but... Um, if someone had gestational diabetes, then are they more likely then as they age? It does increase their risk when we talk about, when you do like the pre-diabetes um, test, the, that quiz to see if you're at risk, um, it is one of the number one things on there that bumps up your risk. Yeah, it does, it does greatly increase your risk of type 2 diabetes. Good question. So is there a time limit, a- uh, or what is the length of time for the value of the strips? How long do they last for the meters? Yes, there. Um, you want to look on the strips. They do have an expiration date on them. All of the strips will have an expiration date. That's usually. It depends. Beer, six it depends months. on when you pick them up from the pharmacy and how long they've been sitting in the pharmacy. To be quite honest, right? Usually, it's quite a long. You can see with their manufacture date and their expiration date. So usually that's quite a long time between the two, but you don't know how long they've been sitting on a shelf somewhere, right? So, yep, always check that expiration date. How often is it that if one person in the family is diabetic, does it go down the family tree or is, are there many studies? You know, that we do say it's familial and there is. It, we do say that it is familial, so we do see that. But sometimes we'll have somebody come in and they'll say, I don't know anybody. And we just say family history starts somewhere, you know. So it can and it can be hit and miss too. So there are some people that don't get it. And it's, it's quite interesting. So, yeah. But you want to remember if you're at risk, you know, if you have a family member, that's when you really want to look at doing those lifestyle things because that can help to prevent that type 2 or delay it for you. So that's really important to keep in mind, okay? Because it is such a strong familial thing. Yep. All right. Well, we're closing up pretty good here. So just remember I had a couple of typos in there. So that one should have been grams, not milligrams. And the one, it said it was long-lasting, and they, they weren't all long-acting ones. So, okay? So a couple typos in there. All right. Okay. Thank you, Lynn, for joining us today and taking time and preparing and presenting this program at Primetime Alive. I think we all learned a lot. I know I did, and really appreciate your time. I would also like to take a moment to remind everyone of our upcoming Primetime Alive programs on Wednesday, November 16th, here in person and virtually, we'll have general safety and scam prevention tips. And on Wednesday, December 7th, we'll present in-person attendance only, reveling in the present moment. So two wonderful programs coming up, and we hope to see you there. Thank you so much for joining us today.